Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. I'm Bill Horan, along with my co-host, Nassau Community College student, Mike DeMarco. Bill, I bet you didn't know that Long Island is home to a nationally recognized and historic boat building community. I didn't know it until I read the book written by our guest, which is filled with stories that we'll hear about today. The book is called Boat Building and Boat Yards of Long Island, A Tribute to Tradition from Arcadia Publishing. And the author is someone we've had on the show before. Yes, let's welcome back Nancy Solomon, who is also the director of Long Island Traditions. And you can find our show uh, all about that organization wherever you listen to podcasts. Nancy, welcome back to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be, to return. We, we're going to have a lot of fun, I think, today because we're going to learn a lot from you. Uh, for those who didn't hear our first show, though, tell us a bit about yourself and how you got interested in the history of boat building. Well, I grew up in Mamaroneck, just across Long Island Sound from Port Washington, where I where I work. And in Mamaroneck, right across the street from our house, was, was a boatyard. And my family had a number of different size sailboats. But I was always very interested. After school, I would rush down to the boatyard because back in the 60s and 70s, there were lobstermen that were coming into Mamaroneck. And I wanted to see what they caught that day and what their traps looked like and how they caught the lobsters. It was just one of those childhood um, interests of mine. And so fast forward many years later, when I got my degree in folklore, there was this job advertised on Long Island to study maritime culture. And I thought, oh, I could do that. So that's how I got interested in in boat builders. We lived across from the McMichaels boat yard and the Nichols boat yard. And there were a number of other boat yards around and there were all these boat builders. So I was steeped in sailboat design, motor boats and everything that comes along with that and the people who use them. To a little kid, that must have been fascinating because little kids, you know, we, we all like whatever we see, whether it's a truck or a pickup or a fire engine. And to see the boat building and the lobster men coming in with the day's catch, that must have been just like heaven on earth. <laughs> it was it was better than being in school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think if I had, you know, been a boy, well, maybe I would have become one of those people. But back in the times that I grew up in, that was not for girls. <laughs> Well, it's funny, Bill. I know you, it's so right what you say because, you know, most children grow up playing with models. And then here you are, you know, playing with the real thing. You know, it's, it's, it actually has practical use. But now uh, I want to know, why did you actually decide to write Boat Building and Boat Yards of Long Island, a tribute to tradition? Well, while I was documenting, you know, fishermen and baymen starting in the late 80s, I was in Freeport. It didn't take very long for me to wonder Where did these boats come from? Who built them? And I was fortunate in Freeport that there were a number of boat builders around. That included Everett Maresca and the Maresca Boatyard. They were still operating. Al Grover had just done his transatlantic crossing across the Atlantic Ocean and broke a Guinness World Record. He had just returned from that journey. And there was John Remsen, who was building garbies for all the baymen. So I was like, well, this is part of what I was asked to do. So I was thrilled and just started documenting as many of the boat builders as I crossed paths with and learning more about boat design um, from them. Nancy, how did you do your research? Um, Are there a lot of other books, not being a boat person or knowing this field, do you just go to the library and find this out? Or is it a matter of talking to kind of the old man at the boat uh, uh, yard and and he tells you a story about the people who came before him, you know, learning through uh, verbal history? Well, as a folklorist, we always start with the people who are carrying on the tradition. So it's literally keeping your ears open and keeping your mind open to learning everything you could about them from them. So I did recorded interviews of everybody who's in their book. 
sometimes more than once with Al Gover. I think I have four interviews that I had to go through. And you, I also went out with them so I could see exactly, you know, how they were designing them. We got an apprenticeship grant for John Remsen. And so he was teaching his son, John Remsen, um, how to build the boat. So we documented everything that he was doing, what kinds of patterns he was using, what kind of wood he was using, where he was cutting his materials from. And so it's through lots of, you know, oral histories. And all of those interviews, by the way, are at Hofstra University at the Long Island Studies Institute. We have a whole collection there. And so it was, you know, going around and then just asking them, who else, you know, does this? Who should we get to know? And that's how I learned about Fred Skopinich, because the Skopiniches used to have a boat yard in Freeport. And Freddie Skopinich and his brother had uh, taken over the Hampton shipyard in East Quag. And, you know, I went out there any number of times. I think I had about four or five interviews with Freddie Skopinich as well. And Howard Pickerel. He was building Garvey's, you know, he started in Huntington, but he was building for a lot of the baymen that I was interviewing just as baymen. And that's how I learned about the pickerel boats. <laughs> so it was really through word of mouth. And, but, you know, as a folklorist, we always want to document everything that we're doing so that other people can learn about them after we're not doing this anymore. And it, you know, people can learn about, you know, the history as well as these traditions. Now, uh, in all your years of experience on the boatyards, and I know you've conducted a lot of interviews over the years, um, but uh, what stories have you heard about the boat builders and the boatyards themselves? Any, interest, any interesting facts that stood out or uh, occurrences? Oh, there's so many great stories. I'm just going to share one of them. Um, Fred Skopinich at his family ran the Freeport Point shipyard in Freeport for many years, starting in the early 1900s until they sold it in the 1950s. And of course, that period includes the rum runners, you know, during Prohibition. And every rum runner needed a boat so that they could get out to Bill McCoy's large, bar, you know, large you know, ships that were coming up from the Caribbean with, with the rum. There were bay houses nearby, so it was a perfect place, you know, get get the booze, you know, from, from the ship, bring it to a bay house. And then when the coast is clear, literally there's no Coast Guard around, you could, you know, then, you know, bring it to a hotel or bring it to a waiting car that might be, you know, at the end of Woodcliffe. Well, one day, um, some of uh, the Skopinich customers were about to go out and pick up their load of booze, and the Coast Guard actually caught them and boarded their boat well while the coast guard was boarding their boat the crew was went onto the coast guard boat and took their boat <laughs> held the coast guard you know the ones who stayed behind on the boat held the coast guardsmen hostage went out picked up their booze brought it back brought it back onto their boat then they released the coast guard men and said to them listen if you report us we're going to report you for taking a bribe because we left some money on your boat Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you probably have a ton of those stories, if I'm right. And one of the other stories that was great is because the Skopiniches were building boats, not just for the rum runners. They were also had a contract to build uh, boats for the Coast Guard. Well, when it came time to fitting the engines, guess who got the faster engines? <laughs> was it the rum runners? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good guess. They said they built probably about, oh, 40 or 45 rum runners boats and built about 30 Coast Guard boats. And so the rum runners had a slightly powerful engine and they had this device where they could create smoke so that they couldn't be followed, especially if it was dark at night, which is when a lot of the booze was being picked up offshore. You know, that, that almost sounds like it should be the name of a Long Island team, the Rum Runners. If you, we had a minor, <laughs> right? Doesn't that, like we had the Long Island Ducks years ago, and I think, uh, I don't know how we got the Dragons, I think there was a team. But Rum Runners, now that you're telling us that, that's just a natural fit. It, it goes into the history of the uh, locale, and it's one of those that we're not going to be competing with other cities for. You know, it's unique to this area. So it might be something you want to hold out and uh, copyright. And then when maybe you can suggest it to somebody who's <laughs> looking for a team name. I, I, if I get someone around here, I definitely will. I like that. And I think that's, 
I, I think upstate New York, they have the river rats. So the rum runners really sound cool for Long Island. You could do a lot with the images. I think we could have a lot of fun. We can make you famous. You, you probably own the team by that time. <laughs> so you're the one who gave us the name. Well, before we continue, I just want to add that you are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Mike DeMarco, along with Bill Horan, and today we are talking about a new book titled Boat Building and Boat Yards of Long Island, A Tribute to Tradition, from Arcadia Publishing, with its author, Nancy Solomon, who is also the director of Long Island Traditions. Nancy, you know, it seems like old history now, but I think it was about nine years ago, we looked at Superstorm Sandy, and that kind of devastated everything. How did that affect the boat building business? Oh, boy. Back then, when Superstorm Sandy hit, I was actually in the process of creating an exhibit that this book came out of called From Shore to Shore, Boat Builders and Boat Yards of Long Island. And we were literally ready to go into fabrication when Sandy hit. And I said, wait a minute. We've got to stop this exhibit because I needed to go back to all of the boat builders and the boatyard owners, especially to see how they fared and what we could learn from them. So the first person that I went to was um, Danny Schmidt at the Davison Boatyard in East Rockaway. And when I called him, he said, well, why don't you come back? You know, I called him like, I think a day or two after Sandy. And he said, why don't you come back next week? The water is still pretty high up here and you may not be able to get to us and you might get flooded if you try and get out of your car. So that was my first um, harbinger. The things were very, very rough, especially in Nassau County. And so when I got to, um, when I finally got to him, it must have been like a week or two later, um, he showed me pictures where you couldn't even tell that people were standing in water. It was that high. It was up to their waist. And he said that, you know, they thought they had done the right thing by moving as many boats as they could into their buildings, taking them out of the water. And what he realizes that the few boats that they kept in the water actually were fine because they were on very tall, they were, they were hooked up to very tall pilings so the boats could go up and down with the tide. Whereas boats that were in the buildings, because of the wind and the flooding, they fell off of their, their stanchions and started knocking into each other. Did that this- was okay. They were able to, you know, put them back on their, on their blocks and, you know, could work and repair them. Many of the boatyards that were near them um, and the marinas didn't fare so well. So a lot of the boats that the marinas were taking care for ended up coming to Davidson's boatyard. And, you know, when I first met him, he was ready to sell the property. He said, you know, cost of of doing business and, you know, with the property taxes and everything was just too much. But he said, because of all the work that was coming this way after Sandy, he was there for another two years. And that's when he sold it. Did a lot of the business have to go out of business because of that? I mean, did they just get wiped out and it didn't make sense to come back? Many of the of the marinas went out of business um, because they were so flooded and they were so damaged. And one of the things a lot of people don't know is you really can't insure a boatyard the way you can a building, you know, a regular business because it's so huge and there's so many buildings. And so they ended up, a lot of the marinas, you know, just closed up for good. Um, another boatyard that was able to, to weather it okay was the Toomey Boatyard, which is in Amityville. And the two owners of the Toomey Boatyard, um, Michael and John Toomey, l- actually live right on the property. And they had, you know, taken precautions. You know, they had, you know, put, you know, again, you know, their boats, you know, in buildings where they could, got them out of the water. They thought they were doing the right thing. And nobody, again, anticipated that the water was going to come up, you know, six feet, ten feet high. And so they were literally in their houses when they heard all of a sudden the boats clunking against each other and hitting against their houses and had to go out in the middle of that just to, you know, to prevent the water from coming inside their houses. 
I know we keep picking your brain about stories, but I guess it comes with the subject. You know, whenever we're talking about boats or the ocean, there's always tales of the sea and the seven seas and whatnot. Uh, but I'm aware uh, in your book you have several people who are profiled. So I'm curious, can you share one or two of the stories uh, that people can read more about of some of those people profiled in your book? I think one of the, the people that I really enjoyed getting to know was Dan Knudsen of Knudsen's Boatyard in Huntington, Hale Site. And Dan Knudsen comes from a long line of boat builders and boatyard owners. His grandfather, Torkel Knudsen, bought it from the Abrams family. And in the early 1900s, there was still quite a bit of xenophobia. And so they decided to keep the name Abrams Boatyard on it for quite a while, a good 20 years before he finally said, listen, I've been here long enough. I want to name it after my family. So that was how the Knudsen's got their name. And one of the things that they were able to do is they got a lot of contracts from the, the Coast Guard and also the Defense Department because they needed boats to help rescue what was then a new technology, the, the airplanes that were being used during World War I. Well, some of them weren't built so good, and so they really needed people to be able to come out and rescue them, especially you know, the Navy um, Defense Forces. And from that, they became a very large employer. Well, after World War II, it's like, okay, now what? And so they pivoted by creating this very popular sailboat that was called the K-35K for Knudsen. And there was also a K-37. And eventually that caught the attention of a very young TV personality by the name of Sonny Fox, which might sound familiar to people of my generation. Um, I'm in my 60s, called Wonderama. Well, before he had Wonderama, he had this show that's called Let's Take a Trip. And so they went to the Knudsen Boatyard, and there's a whole show, it's on our YouTube channel, about the manufacture of them. And Dan Knudsen was very young at that time, and he remembers gee, this is such a great way to meet people from all over the world who were coming to sail and wanted our sailboats. And, you know, he now manages that boatyard. And he's just one of the few boatyard owners who still loves working on boats, especially wooden boats. A lot of boatyards these days, they don't even want to have wooden boats because they don't want to have to deal with getting it in and out of the water. And Knudsen's is one of those people who says, no, we help them and we help take care of their boats and give them pointers and we work alongside them. So there's a real you know, camaraderie there. Nancy, I have to tell you, as you can see, Mike and I are of different ages. And Mike, I'm one up on you on this show because I remember Sonny Fox and watching him on television. And uh, Nancy and I will have to talk about him after the show a little bit. Nancy, your book is called Boat Building and Boatyards of Long Island, A Tribute to Tradition. Where can people get this book if they're into boats and they want to know more about this? Okay, well, you can actually order it directly from us at Long Island Traditions. You can order it directly from the History Press online, and they'll, they'll be able to send it to you. You can buy it at a number of places. You can buy it at the Long Island Maritime Museum in West Sayville. You can buy it at the Oyster Bay Historical Society. You can buy it at some of the Barnes and Nobles um, outlets. I know Smith Haven Mall has it and New Hyde Park has it. You can also buy it at Theodore's Books in Oyster Bay. And, you know, just, you know, if I think if you Google the title, you'll be able to find it any number of places. Now, but funny, funny. Try and support our organization and order it from us if you can. Funny comment, <laughs> Theodore Books was on our show last week. So we interviewed uh, Steve Israel last Steve week Israel. on the show. Yes. So uh, <laughs> this is good. We cross market between the different shows. Now, you've written other books, too, including one called On the Bay. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. Um, On the Bay is about the bay houses of the South Shore in the town of Hempstead. And I wrote that back in the early 90s. And we had a second edition that came out about 10 years ago. And it also looks about the stories of people who own those bay houses and the storms and the hurricanes and duck hunting and building a bay house is a process in and of itself. So that's, that's another book that's available. We also have a movie 
that oh. came out of it. And we also sell the DVD for the movie. You are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Mike DeMarco, along with Bill Horan, and today we are talking about a new book titled Boat Building and Boat Yards of Long Island, A Tribute to Tradition, from Arcadia Publishing with its author, Nancy Solomon, who is also the director of Long Island Traditions. Bill? Nancy, just tell us a little more about this uh, film festival that you talked about. Where is that going to be? And um, is it going to feature like the history of Long Island? Maritime Film Festival was actually supposed to happen two years ago. And COVID hit and it didn't happen. So what we're doing is we're going to be screening a number of documentaries and feature films that look at maritime culture. And then we're going to have guest presentations from the filmmakers or people knowledgeable about the subject that the films address. So, for instance, we are going to be showing the movie um, you know, World Within a World, Bay Houses of Long Island, both at the Cinema Arts Center in Huntington and at the Plaza Cinema Center in Patchogue. And then we'll be talking with the filmmakers. We're also going to be showing a great film called Charlotte, which documents the history of a particular boatyard in Rhode Island and how they were able to save the yard and also build a classic wooden boat. And our guest presenters are going to be Chris Hale and Kevin Weeks, who are both featured in the book. You know, Nancy, it's, and tradition. it's great as we talk to you. I can see how you're beaming and it's fun for us to talk to someone who really loves what they do. And you can see it in talking to you. You look like the little kid on Christmas morning who just saw all the gifts under the tree and like, Oh, boy, this is going to be a great day. But you've been beaming throughout the show. Uh, let me ask you, too, the pandemic, how did that affect, if, or did it, the boat building industry? Well, actually, it helped the boat building industry because more people were anxious to get on the water since nobody could really go anywhere. Nobody wanted to get on a plane. Nobody wanted to travel for fear. You know, this is, you know, especially the first year when we didn't have the vaccines. And so people were desperate to um, have a boat and it did very well for, 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 the, for the people who had boats to sell and the people who had always had a boat and may have only gone at it a couple of times, all of a sudden they were going out every weekend. And I guess officially, if, if you're going out on a, a boat, it's probably just you and a few friends who you might be in contact with anyway. And other than that, you pretty well, the social distancing aspect, you were away, certainly you're out on the water, you're away from everybody and um, probably was a good escape. Absolutely. And because it was outdoors and there's usually a good wind when you're out boating, it was much safer than a lot of other things that um, could be done. That's why the parks got so crowded. People could be outdoors and there was a breeze and it was you, know, you could separate a little bit. And um, yeah, so, so boating has been good for the pen, you know, um, during the pandemic. There have been some downsides because of the supply chain issues that we talked about. A lot of boat dealerships couldn't even take orders because they didn't know when they were going to be able to fill them. And as a result, some of the boat shows last year were canceled because of that issue. Well, hopefully we'll get all back to it and now everybody can enjoy it uh, and, and get the benefits of the good Long Island waters. Yeah, it's interesting because as you know, as stressful as the pandemic was, there were these uh, little minor silver linings that people were able to come out strong with. And uh, but, you know, listen, there's no end to, I guess, your research, because apparently you have another book, too, that you wrote called Traditional Architecture of Long Island, a teacher's resource guide. Now, what's that all about? Is this uh, brought into school sometimes or? Well, this was a pilot project that we did in the early 2000s with a number of different schools and teachers, primarily um, the Connecticut uh, the Comsawag School District and the Huntington School District. And it gives teachers different units that are part of their curriculum on how to understand the people that settled here on Long Island, starting with the Native Americans, then uh, the English and Dutch settlers, then um, people who are building different kinds of churches and grist mills. And so the idea is that these this is a, a different way of teaching our local history through the architecture. And there are document-based questions as part of the publication. And, you know, it's, I know teachers who have used it who said it's just been such a 
more expansive way of understanding how our island looks the way it does and how it's changed over the years. Nancy, tell us, you, you mentioned another uh, organization, Long Island Traditions. Tell us a little bit about that, what it does, and your role in it. Well, our organization um, is dedicated to documenting, presenting, and preserving traditional culture and architecture through understanding the people who are carrying on those traditions today. And so we do a number of programs. Some are maritime oriented and architecture. We also do programs on different ethnic groups that call Long Island home. So we work with gospel singers, Irish step dancers, Native American uh, bead workers, a whole range of, of cultural expressions. And you know, we partner with the East Meadow Library to present these programs, either live or virtually. We have a program coming up with a woman whose family came from India and Iraq and is Jewish. <laughs> and so, so that's, it's, it's a broad range of, of programs that we try and you know, help support the people that are carrying on these traditions and provide opportunities for artists um, to interact with the public. What is one thing that you want to leave our audiences when it comes to your book, Boat Building and Boat Yards on Long Island? Support your local boat yard. There are so many wonderful boat yards that are part of our working waterfront landscape. A lot of them are closing their doors and becoming condominiums. So if you can, tell your elected officials, please help support them so that we continue to remind ourselves we're on an island. This is part of our heritage. And you know, that's, that's what we're hoping to accomplish with this book. I guess we want to keep those traditions around because they pass all too quickly. And then we find that we're just like any other city or any other area. And uh, we kind of let the good things get away from us. Nancy, we thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thanks to Nancy Solomon for being with us today. And we'd like to remind our audience that our guest today has been Nancy Solomon. She's the author of Boat Building and Boat Yards of Long Island, a tribute to tradition. Nancy, we appreciate you taking time. Thanks for being with us and good luck. Thank you. It's always a pleasure seeing you, Bill, and nice to meet you, Mike. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Bill Aran. I'm here with Mike DeMarco. We thank you for listening to this week's special edition of My Hometown. We'd like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College, where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown.